All right, guys, what I'm going to do real quick here. Oh, we got some impatient ones. What I want to do is I want to cover briefly, and I just kind of got going on the other stuff there. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about fishing the rivers. Okay? It's simple. And it, you'll get the fly guys throwing rocks at you. It's pretty fun. Okay, what happens? We're talking about like our little yabbies. What's the yabbies? That little small crawdad, eighth ounce. They come smaller, I don't know, eight sixteenth, whatever the small one is. We're talking typically eighth ounce jig head, three sixteenths at the most. Um, and we're talking countdown Rapalas, small guys, taking the hooks off and putting the single side wash on it. When you get your subscription thing, because Josh will have it tonight, you'll see how to rig a Rapala up for the river. It's off one of our shows. It's in the technique section of how to put it on there, because you got to use a single barbless hook. Now, whether it's cutthroat, brown trout, or rainbow trout, it's all the same rules. <clears throat> the river, when I was a kid, and it's changed now, but it used, to, it used to open up in June. June was when it opened, June 1st. That protected to the spawn, and it closed down October 31st. And that's typically when I fish my streams anyway. What you're gonna find, you're gonna, hey Randy, we went up to Randy's favorite spot, up to Coeur d'Alene River. Fly fishing, okay? We were doing a fly show. I got thousands and thousands of dollars in flies. I make my progressions, I get nothing. I said, Randy, enough's enough. I got my dad with me. Dad, he's just looking at me like, can I, can I, can I? Can I? <laughs> so I said, all right, Dad, it's time. Six, 16 ounce jig head. Three inch Berkeley walleye grub. Three inch Berkeley walleye grub. Pumpkin seed or black, whatever. Goes in, we just, I just got done fly fishing the water. He comes in to high me and gets about a 17, 18 inch cutthroat. Randy's, we're in Randy's spot, him and his wife. She's giving me scowls back there right now. <laughs> we went down a little further, I taught it on a yabby, a little crawdad, and we just, all we ended up doing was just turning the camera off and catching fish. And Randy was even saying, I can't believe the size of these cutthroat that are being caught. And he was stubborn, he's gonna throw his fly, I got this one. This grasshopper, man, it always works. Inch. Yeah, throw it out there, go ahead. <laughs> but it, it just wasn't working. And never fail. These little tiny curl tail grubs will just catch piles of fish. Funnest thing you can do is take son, daughter, niece, nephew, grandson, granddaughter, whatever, for a weekend to a small stream somewhere. There's a lot of them around here. Tie them up with four pound test monofilament on a six and a half foot ultralight rod, small spinning reel, or if they have to use a push button, fine. A small jig head, and let them throw. They don't even have to really know what they're doing, and they're gonna catch fish. The biggest fish in your system, and these rivers, guys, they're feeding on sculpin, they're feeding on crawdads, they're feeding on the big insect larvae down there, the big dragonfly nymphs, the big stuff down there. That's what they're eating. I've even had a few of them guys, the fly guys, say, hey, you know, I'm a fly guy, but I watched your show, so I went and got some of those, and I caught some huge fish. <laughs> Whispering through the internet. <laughs> they don't want their buddies to know. If they're sitting in the current, and if, guys, yeah, you know, I've been fly fishing since I was seven. It's fun. They will feed on it. You can get big fish on it. But to consistently catch them, this little tiny jig will work. Here's what happens. If you got big old fatty sitting down in the bottom right here, and you've got the stream rolling through, and if I bounce my little jig like that, or I've got something that's the size of something that most of you guys can't even see up here, and this is something bigger down here, Remember the reward thing? If it's just going ba doink, ba doink, ba doink, and all I have to do is kind of slide over and ah. Huh? Or I got to go up here charging after something that looks like a piece of cotton. Okay? 
All right. If I go fly fishing, guys, I got something that looks so dis disturbing that it, what is it? It's a big old nasty something. One of the best flies out there for big fish is called a Chernobyl ant. It's not tiny. It's made out of foam. It's huge. It's got legs. Well, yeah, because you're giving them some reward, man. They're going to go up there and get something. They're not going to go up there and go, hey, I got the... You know when you're going down on your boat and something hits your teeth? Oh, that's a... Bleh. I've never spit out a hamburger, for crying out loud. All right. Jeez. It's crazy. Okay. So it's a reward thing. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> here's what I want you to do. And now this is more for the safety of the fish. If you guys go cutthroat fishing, I want you to use 16th ounce. Short shanked hooks. Okay, short shanked hooks. And those little small ones. Now you can throw a 3 inch bass minnow on there. Fine. If you try to put a 4 inch grub on one of those, and you'll see what I'm talking about when you go in and look at the big bulk jig bend. You'll see a long shank and a short shank. For the cutthroat, what can happen? Because you're dealing with a fish that's, you know, 12 inches, 14 inches up to, you know, if it's a good one, it's 20, 21 inches. That's a huge one. But what happens when you run like an eighth ounce jig head, it's got a big wide bend hook on it. And when you pinch the barb down and whatnot, when you throw that big hook out there, you're going to hook that fish. And a lot of times if they take it deep, you hook them, it's going to go right up into their brain. And they're done. I mean, they're dead when you bring them in. So just for the safety of the fish, because, you know, cutthroat are endangered, let's just do it right. A little 16th ounce on a four-pound test, a little tiny hook in there, and a three-inch bass minnow, just like we use for drop shotting, the miracle bait, or that little three-inch curl tail grub, and you're not going to damage those fish. Now, for right out behind us here, any river I go to that's bigger, we're talking big fish, the bigger jigs, you're fine because you're dealing with a bigger fish. You're running a barbless hook, you're not going to hurt them. You can run the four inch curl tail grub, Berkeley, just like the ones you got. A couple of tricks when you do this, guys, and this is especially true when you're fishing with your kids. And if you lose a jig head, hey, no problem. A lot of times it's so shallow you can walk out there and get it back. And we're going to talk about how to fish it here in a second, but I want to show you a little trick. If you have your jig head, like so, okay, that's an awesome jig head. If you have your jig head like this, this is how traditionally it's set up, all right? What I want you to do when you're fishing in a current is you're going to take your pliers, you're going to grab it at the back of this bend, and you're going to turn it down. And you're going to say, well, that's not going to work. Trust me, it'll work just fine. You know the circle hooks that are on the market today? So that the fish doesn't swallow your bait? What happens with those, the way that they're shaped and they're bent over, you don't really set the hook. All you do is pull tension. Because what it does is if they swallow it, it allows it to slide out, and then when they turn their head, it drives the hook in. So you always get them on the outside. What you're doing here, because they're going to want to eat this thing. They're going to want to chow on it. What you're doing by bending it down is two things. By putting that point down below your tie eye, it acts like a weed guard, so it can't stick in the rocks. The other thing it does, when that fish takes it, all you do is pull tight, and you get them out here. Not going to damage them. It's not like going and catching a bass, where they're a little tough, a little rugged. These things are a little more delicate. When you catch one, get your hands wet. I got some pretty good grippers. You're never going to see me splitting one and a half. I see even the best of the, on the TV, just squeezing the tar out of them. When you pick it up, you get your hands wet. You kneel down. You don't do it on the rocks. You keep it in the water. When you go to pick it up, you grab it back to belly, and you rotate it upside down in your hand. It causes them to become disoriented. Try it next time you're steelhead fishing. You got a wild one on the bank, flip them upside down. They just go, whoo, hey, it's all weird now. <laughs> it causes them to relax. Then you can take the hook, and you're just holding them nice and gentle. You can take the hook out, get your pictures, whatever, put them back. That's the biggest concern that I have when I tell people about this, because what's going to happen? 
You're going to go to these creeks, guys. You're going to catch more fish than you ever knew that was in there. You're going to go, what in the world? I didn't know there were so many fish in here. Because they're all sitting down there lower. But just handle them with care. You mentioned two colors on the curl tail. Yep. Black and pumpkin seed. That's your closest, uh, closest imitation to a sculpin. They're usually some shade of brown or olive. The black is most of your insect larva. Now when you're fishing these <coughs> streams, guys, remember the 90% of the water holds 10% of the fish, or 90% of the fish are in 10% of the water? Same rule. What you're looking for is eddies. You're looking for something that's causing a current break because when the current is moving, not wind, when it's moving, they have to stage behind something, right? Same principle. If we've got a stream coming down and it makes a hard bend like this, and it makes a hard bend like this, typically this shoreline is what? A little more sloping, right? It's cutting over here. If it's a steep enough point, it's creating an eddy back in here, right? Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Where these fish will hold at is right on the edge of that fast water to the slick water. Reason being is, is it's swirling in there, it's creating less resistance on them. The other thing it's doing is it's trapping forage in there. It's trapping the forage in there. Now what you'll find was the setup like this, and this pertains to the same thing. When you guys saw the wall I show, we're fishing in the fast water. You got a head and a tail. Every eddy has a head and a tail. So you've got, you got your point and you got your, you're creating your eddy like this. And it's coming around. And the current always runs backwards, right? Runs up the shore. You got the fast water breaking out here. First thing you fish is always at the head. Always fish the head. You're standing at the shoreline, usually in the center. I like to cast up. The further you cast up, the faster it gets to the bottom because the current drives it down. 16th ounce jig head can get to the bottom. You just got to cast further up. As it comes down, I'm just reeling slightly to keep tension and I'm bouncing through this seam. I let it swing around. There's be a point right in here where you don't have to reel anymore. You just tap and tap and little tiny jerks, boom, boom, boom. And then it swings, bring it in. If the fish aren't up in here, a lot of times they'll come right back into the back end of this and they'll actually be facing this direction down here at the tail end. Those walleye, if you watch that footage, I've got a magical boat. Because my boat is sitting this way and the current's going by like this. Because I fished up here and didn't get anything, so I spun my boat around, tuck it to the shore. We're talking about walking, but I'm talking about the boat right now. And those walleyes are back. They'll tend to rest back here. Because what happens where this meets back up again, you get a nice separation line back here. Where you got the current spinning around and the current going past, it forms like this little triangle thing. You'll find them sitting back there in that slower water. So just because they weren't up here in the head doesn't mean they're not here in the tail. So to fish the tail, what I'd do is stand here, I'd throw out in here, let the current walk it around. And I'd let it swing like this, and then I, as it comes to me up the shoreline, I start working it. Everybody always aims in for here. Active guys will be here, but there'll be some back here every time, guarantee it. Now, <clears throat> what happens, a lot of times you'll find a stretch of river that doesn't have anything. There's no bends, it's running flat. What you're going to do is you're going to find the biggest rock out there, and that's where your fish are going to be sitting. If your stream is running down straight like so, and it's just kind of riffling up through everything, if you've got a boulder out in the center like this, even if it's above or under the water, it doesn't matter. What you'll see is the current rolling around and doing one of these numbers. They'll just sitting right back here. What I like to do with these spots is I don't cast right in on top of them right here. What I like to do is cast, if I'm standing over here, I'll cast up, try to hit this edge, and let it force down through here. So it rides through that swirl right there, here and here. There's a section down here on the river the show that we did, and it was one of the first ones. It was before Mickey. It was my show. It was called Hooked on Fishing. And one of the problems that people have, and it was with me, I grew up fishing this river. I mean, I learned how to read water and understand what's read water mean. Well, a lot of times you can't see... If you're not conditioned to see what you're looking at, you can't see these little breaks right here. And there's a spot up there, if we want to call it something like this. It runs over, there's some boulders and stuff in here, and there's some distinctive shoots. 
that come through like this, and here and here. And all I was doing, I had six seams in there. And I'm standing over here. And there's six seams in here. And all I do is just keep bouncing through those. Pitch my stuff up here, work it down this edge, pitch over the other side of the rock, pitch down here, and work it down through. If you can't, and it's a great thing to do with kids, if you can't see it with your eyes, all you got to do is just go up, find some dead leaves, whatever, crumple them up in your hand, and throw them out in the river. Watch them go. If they're cooking along and all of a sudden they start slowing down, there it is. Where they're slowing down and swirling, there's where they're at. Because sometimes you can't even hardly see them. Polarized glasses help. But throw some leaves out. Do it with your kids. Throw some leaves out. Pine needles. Say, hey, watch them. See how they're cruising down through there? Now when they stop, see where they're spinning, they're slowing down. Where they, where they start spinning slower, moving slower, that's where you want to fish at. If you can't visually see it with your eye.